Daddy, where do babies come from? Uh, well, uh, honey. Mommy went to the store. Oh, well, you see, um, well, there's a mommy and a daddy, right? Right. And see, when they call Geico,、uh, they could save a bunch of money on car insurance. Oh, really? And that makes them happy? Yes, that makes them very happy. That's good. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we could have this talk, Sunshine. <laughs> Geico, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Bee in Eden, which is being broadcast on Podfire Radio at the website podfireradio.com. My name is Sedona Deb, and I am your hostess and the creator of this show. You can find me on the internet at slaythebankster.com, and you can also find YouTube archives of the show along with links to my written transcript for each episode. Now, besides creating the Be and Eden shows, I also write articles every week for other websites, and I can be found on Twitter. But just remember my homepage of slaythebankster.com, and you can jump over to any of those features. I'd like to thank the sponsors of Podfire Radio who are making these wonderful internet programs possible, and thank you, the listeners, who have accompanied me on this journey. The folks at AmbientMixer.com have provided that B Buzz music you hear playing in the background and in between the breaks. May the wind blowing through the chimes invite you to buzz along with me as we explore lessons from mankind's past. Our goal here at the B in Eden is to begin anticipating our future by remembering our past. And with that in mind, today's episode is entitled Antarctica, the Cheerleader from Chile. Now, this is the seventh installment of our eight part series about the exploration of Antarctica during the 20th century. In our previous show, we talked about the disinformation campaign that seemed to be rolled out with the posthumous publication of Admiral Byrd's. So called secret diary. But this book was bent on confusing the facts of Admiral Byrd's polar missions and was written by a man whose family actually owned Bank of America. Curious fact when we also consider that the Rockefeller family has been sponsoring Admiral Byrd from the beginning of his career. We talked Also, about the unanswered questions that surrounded the suspicious suicide of, of America's first Secretary of Defense, James Forrestal, the man who had oversight of that disastrous Operation High Jump expedition down to Antarctica in February of 1947. Now, in today's episode, we will talk about the perpetuation of the ancient beliefs. About Nordic supermen after World War II. You might think that the old legends of Aryan ancestors and supernatural drill energy would have become unpopular now that the Nazi Party had apparently been defeated in 1945. However, as we shall see, the exact 
opposite happened. In fact, the survivors of the Nazi party literally doubled down and increased their propaganda about this coming race of human hybrid supermen. The flames of those beliefs were fanned into a blazing fire by newcomers to the conversation, like a man named Miguel Serrano, a government emissary born in Chile. And he's the person we are calling our cheerleader from Chile. Even today, even as recently as two months ago, I've seen that more movies are coming out to proclaim and herald this coming race of superhumans. This movie that you may see advertised is called Super Sapiens, sort of like the word homo sapiens, but it's the word super sapiens. And it's not even being presented as a science fiction story. It's being presented as a documentary of the technology that is now available to launch mankind into a new world of sorts of enhanced humanity. Now, we're going to take our first break here, and then we'll dive into this post-war world of esoteric Hitlerism and how that energized even more interest in the South Pole as mankind entered the atomic age in the 1950s. We'll be right back. Millions of people reuse their shopping bags every day, and Whole Foods Market makes it easier by offering a better bag in two different sizes. Find out more ways to make a green change at WholeFoodsMarket.com. That's WholeFoodsMarket.com. Hi, this is Jennifer Coolidge. The American Heart Association says the disco song Stayin' Alive is the near-perfect beat for hands-only CPR. If you see a teen or adult collapse from cardiac arrest, you only need two steps to help save a life. Call 911 and push hard and fast in the center of the chest to the beat of the song Staying Alive. Disco is back and it's saving lives. To learn more, go to heart.org slash handsonlycpr. Nationally supported by the WellPoint Foundation. back. Antarctica is an odd magnet that attracts both scientific study as well as fiercely devoted esoteric beliefs. In today's show and the episode that I have posted at my blog that accompanies this show, we'll take a look at how an undying faith in the long-denied heritage of an elite race of superhumans headquartered in Antarctica persisted long after World War II and is still going strong today. Near the end of this story, we'll also touch on the physical evidence picked up by Antarctica's international science stations that indicated that the Nazi connection to the South Pole is being closely monitored even today. Now, before the break, we mentioned this man, Miguel Serrano. He was one of the leading figures of this post-war ideology that some have termed esoteric 
Hitlerism. Mr. Serrano died barely eight years ago, but his influence in books are very much alive today. Serrano served as Chile's ambassador to India, and he also served uh, other countries during the Cold War era. In fact, all of the countries that he served in the diplomatic field have connections to these Aryan legends that connect the dots between the Germanic peoples and their ancestral migrations through Central Asia and Tibet. In a book entitled Arctos, the Polar Myth in Science, Symbolism, and Nazi Survival, author Jocelyn Godwin writes a very comprehensive summary of Serrano's role in the propagation of the idea that the technocratic heritage of the Aryan race is bound up with the ancient race of Nordic supermen or what Bible readers would interpret as Nephilim or fallen angels. And that book is generally available through the Internet. I'll be quoting from some of the pages in this book. Uh, Godwin wrote, Serrano is a major figure which makes it all the more important to know what really lies behind his polished and poetic work. The translated title of Serrano's book, published as recently as 1984, is this, Adolf Hitler, The Last Avatar. Serrano was born in Chile in the year 1917, and he was a firm believer in the Hitler survived meme that followed World War II. Serrano maintained that Hitler escaped Berlin and assumed an existence away from the public eye in an underground base in Antarctica. From his headquarters in the land of the South Pole, Hitler supposedly switched gears from directing an exoteric war to an esoteric one. Serrano's vision of the Aryan history traces its roots to, quote, beings who arrived on Earth from outside the galaxy and founded the first Hyperborea in the extreme northern hemisphere, end quote, in the Arctic region. Supposedly, this land of Hyperborea, or as the Germans also called it, Thule, as in the phrase the Thule Society, Hyperborea existed outside the rulership of the so-called minor god or demiurge. And I'm going to spell that. It's capital D like David, E-M like Mary, I-U-R-G-E. This is a word that comes up in a lot of New Age and Gnostic beliefs, the demiurge. This god is thought of as being an evil, lesser god promoted by the Semitic peoples in their Old Testament and known as Yahweh or Jehovah in its anglicized transliteration. Serrano put forward the idea that worshippers of Yahweh or Jehovah have tried to erase the racial memory of the pre-Diluvian white gods. This to them, is the great piracy against the Aryan race and their Germanic descendants. The story goes that the people of Hyperborea commanded a form of free energy called Vril, spelled V like Victor, R-I-L, the Vril. This energy flowed like a green light in their veins. That's why it was imperative to keep their bloodline pure and free of what they termed Semitic contamination. It was incumbent upon them to avoid interracial marriage so that they could maintain the flow of that energy light that coursed through their bodies. However, some of these Hyperboreans succumbed to temptation and did marry the daughters of the lesser race of humans, a story mirrored in the familiar Bible tale. Then came the terrestrial calamity of an earthwide flood that resulted from a pole shift triggered by an unhappy encounter between Earth and a comet. Serrano claims that survivors of the deluge scattered wherever they could. Supposedly, some of the purebred real people made it to Antarctica, 
and learned how to survive in caverns where they had access to fresh water and shelter in the harsh climate. Others migrated towards the Himalayas and up to Tibet. From there, the races of humankind with whom we are most familiar picked up the threads of their lives. Now, depending on whose version of this tale you're reading, these spiritual centers in Tibet and Antarctica became associated with the mystical city names of Agartha and Shambhala, or you may have heard of the phrase Shangri-La. Now, that is the root of the Nazi rampage against Judaism, the belief that the tribes of Jacob began dominating the world under the guidance of an Old Testament God who was a cruel bully or demiurge. The world would be better off without them and would one day be conquered by a revitalized human hybrid superforce. Now, oddly enough, the Nazis did not invent that belief. The idea of the God of the Bible being regarded as an evil demiurge began gaining traction as far back as the year 100 A.D. The Christian disciple Marcion of Sinope or Sinope, who very likely enjoyed the acquaintance of the actual Apostle John himself, could not reconcile the God of war in the Old Testament with the God of love being preached by Christians. He began promoting the idea that the Old Testament God and the New Testament God must therefore be different beings. Many people agreed with him, began following his teachings, and they came to be known as Marcionites, followers of Marcion. Now, eventually, Marcion was kicked out of the Christian congregation at a time when multiple apostasies began growing like weeds until the body of early Christian teachings was nearly unrecognizable by the latter half of the 4th century A.D. The aged Apostle John may have had Marcion in mind, when he penned his words now found in the Bible at the book of Second John, verse 7, his warning about the deceivers, the composite antichrist that had already arrived who denied Christ as having been born fully as a human. Ironically, this was another belief that Marcion held to, the idea that Christ's birth was not even as a human being, not as a full human being. Many, if not all, of these late Christian apostate doctrines were outgrowths of earlier ideas that had been spread by Plato and other Greek philosophers only 400 years before the birth of Marcion, including this idea that Yahweh or Jehovah was an evil demiurge. But where did Plato get his ideas? Plato's rise as a philosopher was financed and promoted by that same group of Babylonian, Judean, temple banksters of whom I have written so often outside of this Antarctica series. This is the great dot that intersects these modern Antarctica mysteries with the ancient path of mankind's misery in old Babylon. That compulsion by elite societies to reconnect with the mighty superheroes of an advanced civilization that preceded the global flood. And these facts about Plato's origins will be picked up in future blogs and shows here at the Bee in Eden. The author of the previously mentioned book, Arctos, acknowledges an unexpected alliance between post-war Nazis and falsely called Jews on pages 127 through 129. A new generation rising from this Nazi diaspora began to see that it was to their mutual advantage to join forces if they would finally achieve their goal of restoring superhumanity. And in this book, Arctos, by Jocelyn Godwin, he writes, he refers to an earlier book uh, written by a man named Gene Robin, a book called Operation Orth. And Mr. Godwin 
is now recounting what this other author has published. And this is what was published. The claim was made that Hitler died in 1953 and that his body is enshrined and visible in a hexagonal casket side by side with that of Raoul Wallenberg, the Swedish diplomat who saved thousands of Hungarian Jews. Now, hold that thought in your head because that sounds too weird. Why would someone who is credited with killing millions of Jews be buried side by side with a person who is credited with saving so many Jews? Well, to these people's minds, this dual presence poses no problem to the many Jews who belong to the black order. They blame their fellows for their refusal to collaborate with the evolutionary process. Now, that idea of the evolutionary process of man is what we're seeing today being expressed through the movement called transhumanism. And that's, that was the end of that quote for a minute. Now, if all of that isn't hard enough to swallow, another data point has popped up among the transhumanist movement and Ray Kurzweil's coming singularity. Ray Kurzweil is known as a senior engineer with Google and is associated with that strata of industry we refer to as big data. But the, uh, his, his uh, coming singularity is something that Ray Kurzweil has long said will be hitting us around the year, ninth, or the year 2030 and beyond. But there's an unexpected coincidence between Ray Kurzweil's ideas and something that was penned way back in 1922 by a Polish author named Ferdinand Osendowski in a book called Beasts man, and God. Now, we're going to take our middle break here, but when we come back, you will be stunned to find out what common year these two people had in mind. So hang tight, and we'll be right back. And we're back. More than one million wild animals are killed each year illegally. Poaching is a major threat to our country's wildlife. I'm Tom Barry. I'm an actor with a desire to preserve living space for wildlife. The Humane Society Wildlife Land Trust does just that. Works with private landowners to protect wildlife to preserve natural habitats. To learn more or to work with the Humane Society Wildlife Land Trust, call 800-729-SAVE. That's 800-729-SAVE or visit wildlifelandtrust.org. Thank you. back. Right before the break, I was mentioning a Polish author named Ferdinand Osendowski, who way back in 1922 presented his idea of this coming super race that would 
unleash themselves from these, this mystical land of Agartha or Shambhala. And in his, I, his worldview, he believed that there would be a king of the world that would manifest when the time had come for him to lead all the good people of the world against the bad. Now, here's the point. He actually pinpointed the year 2029 as the year when the peoples of Agartha would swarm forth from their subterranean caverns onto the surface of the earth. Now, if the year 2029 sounds familiar to people who follow technology, it may be because that date has popped up in at least one unrehearsed statement that was made by Ray Kurzweil, that famous Google engineer and author of the book and idea called The Singularity. During a a public forum when he was answering a question about whether computers and artificial intelligence have now attained consciousness, this is what Ray Kurzweil said to the audience. I have predicted that it will happen by 2029, and if we don't accept it, they will get mad at us, and they will be very smart, so we won't want that to happen. And then the audience chuckled and laughed at at his prediction. Now, I, I found it strange that Kurzweil singled out the year 2029 because he usually speaks about the year 2030 or beyond, whenever he is asked about the coming singularity, that transcendence of man towards reaching a state of pure deification rooted firmly in cool machine logic. So let that little data point from two men who lived a 100 years apart simmer on the back burner of your mind. They were both pointing to the year 2029. And all of that should really keep make, keep making us ponder the question exactly what is going on down there under the ice in Antarctica. Now, in the blog that is posted along with this uh, article, I have a very interesting uh, transcript of a conversation held with a a survivor of the Nazi SS named Wilhelm Landig. And he absolutely swears that that the Germans did maintain a fleet of UFO vehicles just like the ones that Admiral Byrd attested to having seen in 1947, but that there were certain problems that the people had with living in Antarctica and they had a base there, but because they had lost their immunity to disease, they had to move back to the mainland in Argentina and Chile. It's quite an interesting interview and, of course, no one can say for sure whether this man was making things up, but there are several things that he mentioned that have intersected with other points that we have come to understand about Antarctica. And one of them is something unusual that Dr. Joseph Farrell noted in his book uh, called Roswell and the Reich. He noticed that, um, let's see, Uh, He noticed something that I'll I'll quote from page 512 of that book. He refers to earlier research published by Henry Stevens in his own book entitled Hitler's Suppressed and Still Secret Weapons, Science, and Technology. And Dr. Farrell reprinted some of Stevens' seismograms in his own book. And Dr. Farrell noted that there were certain readings recorded at the American station at the Amundsen South Pole Station whose seismometers are located in such a fashion that they are surrounding the old German area called New Schwabenland. Okay, now that alone was interesting. The Americans ringed the area that Germany used to occupy or still does occupy in North North Antarctica with a series of uh, uh, machines that would record seismic seismic events. Now, he noticed something unusual happen on March 20th, 2003, which happens to be the same time of the Iraq invasion that was 
going on during the Gulf War. And um, Dr. Farrell says, Stephen cites the research of German seismic researcher Christian Saul, who interprets this to be an American attack on New Schwamland using the new boring atomic weapon announced at the time of the Iraq invasion. Moreover, adding credits to this idea, the date on the first seismograph at the top here is March 20th, 2003, the very day the United States began its massive bombardment of Baghdad. Mr. Saul maintains that while the world's attention was diverted to Iraq, the United States was using bunker-busting atom bombs to attack the Nazi base in Antarctica. The defense, according to Mr. Saul, apparently held because there was a second such attack launched, as is demonstrated on the second seismogram. And Dr. Farrell goes on to note that the wavelengths that were recorded on the seismogram may even indicate the presence of an, an, a type of technology that would go beyond uh, a nuclear explosion. So all of that is quite incredible, and I know it's a lot to take in. And I can see by the clock on the wall that our time together is coming to an end, and it's time for me to buzz back to the beehive. But in our next episode, we'll present the final series in our episode about Antarctica, where you will learn what kind of scientific experiments are being done even now. I'd like to thank the listeners of PodfireRadio.com, and I look forward to all of us getting back together. Be sure to visit the other shows and, and take a look at the sponsors who keep making these shows possible. Okay, until next time, this is Sedona Deb buzzing back to the beehive. Napa guy knows not to judge a man by his car's multicolor paint job or absence of modern gadgetry. Who cares if it's technically old enough to vote and the windows are powered by the strength of your left arm? Your monthly payment is zero, and it'll stay that way. Because with over 500,000 parts and a little Napa know-how, you can keep anything on the road. She may not be pretty, but she's all yours. That's Napa know-how. Napa know-how.